This segment is on the general adaptation syndrome. This segment really helps us to learn how hormones help us with stress. Stress can be either emotional or physical. A stress can last for a couple of hours, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, or even longer. There are three phases to the general adaptation syndrome. The first phase is called the alarm phase. During the alarm phase, an immediate response to the stress occurs. In this phase, the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system directs the response. In this phase, sympathetic stimulation will stimulate the adrenal medulla to secrete norepinephrine and epinephrine. We know from this chapter that when norepinephrine and epinephrine are stimulated, there are several responses that the body will give, and these responses are all similar to the fight or flight mode of the sympathetic nervous system. For instance, energy reserves will be mobilized. During the fight or flight response, the body is going to need more energy, more energy for muscles, more energy for um, all sorts of cellular activity. And so these energy reserves have to be mobilized. Glycogen is a primary energy reserve, and glycogen will be mobilized by being broken down into glucose. Now the cells can use glucose. They take glucose and through several different processes can create ATP. Second, with this ATP, the body can now prepare to deal with the stress causing factor by the fight or flight response. This means increased mental alertness. It means increased energy use by all cells. It means there will be changes in circulation, meaning the blood will be redirected to the muscles where they're needed. It means a reduction in digestive activity. It means increased sweat gland secretion and it means increased heart rate and respiratory rate. These are all the responses that we see in the fight or flight or the sympathetic nervous system response and these are the things you're going to see in that first phase called the alarm phase. The second phase is called the resistance phase. If a stress lasts longer than a few hours the individual enters this phase which is called the resistance phase. In this phase glucocorticoids are the dominant hormone whereas in the alarm phase norepinephrine and epinephrine were the dominant hormones. Glucocorticoids again are our glucose sparing hormones. Other hormones that are involved in the resistance phase are epinephrine, growth hormone, and thyroid hormone. The energy demands in this phase remain higher than normal. This is partly because of the combined effects of these hormones. Neural tissue can't store glucose so when the body hits this phase, it's going to do whatever it can to spare whatever glucose it does have for the nervous tissue, for the brain, for the spinal cord, for the peripheral nerves. But since the glucose is being spared, which we call glucose sparing, the other tissues have to get their energy from some other source. The glycogen reserves have been depleted after several hours, so they really become depleted during the alarm phase. Neural tissue has a high demand for energy, and yet neural tissue really can't store any glucose, and glucose is needed to create that energy or that ATP. If the blood glucose levels fall too far, neural function will deteriorate. At first, the glycogen reserves will be mobilized, as we saw in the alarm phase, but after a while, those reserves become depleted. Now the body has to turn to other sources for energy. Metabolism will be turned away from glucose and mobilization of lipids from adipose tissue and amino acids from skeletal muscle will be used instead of glucose for the production of ATP. This however means that a person will start to lose fat so they lose weight and they're also going to lose skeletal muscle mass also in the resistance phase we get an elevation of blood glucose levels. The remaining energy reserves are already mobilized so lipids are released by adipose tissue and amino acids are released by skeletal muscle but also the liver will synthesize its own glucose and it does so by using other chemicals in the body, other amino acids and other chemicals that are in the body to create a brand new glucose. We call this process gluconeogenesis. Also in this resistance phase we have the pancreas 
that will secrete glucagon. Glucagon will stimulate the liver to break down glycogen into glucose and to release the glucose from the liver, thereby elevating the blood glucose levels as well. And lastly, in this resistance phase, the adrenal cortex will also release aldosterone, which is the main mineralocorticoid, and aldosterone along with ADH, which is released from the posterior pituitary, will help to conserve sodium as well as conserve water. Both of these are reabsorbed at the kidney at the expense of potassium and hydrogen, which will be lost at the kidney. The last phase in this general adaptation syndrome is called the exhaustion phase. The body's lipid reserves are sufficient to maintain the resistance phase for weeks or even months. But when the resistance phase ends, the exhaustion phase will begin. Unless corrective actions are taken almost immediately, the failure of one or more organ systems will prove to be fatal. The production of aldosterone in the resistance phase results in conserving sodium by having sodium be reabsorbed by the kidney, but at the expense of potassium. So for everyone, sodium that's reabsorbed potassium is excreted in the form of urine. As the body's potassium content declines, a variety of cells begin to malfunction. We know that the heart is an organ that needs potassium in order to function properly. One complication of the exhaustion phase would be heart failure. Ultimately what happens in the exhaustion phase is that the lipid reserves are exhausted Second, there's damage, either structurally or functionally, to vital organs. And third, there's a failure of electrolyte balance. And the loss of potassium will lead to organ failure and death.